All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, the uh, TGC conference session on trans, non-binary, and gender non-conforming artists telling our stories. Um, I am so happy to be here with uh, my fellow trans artists, and um, we're here today to talk about how um, our stories are evolving in and becoming more popular in the mainstream and um, the challenges and joys that we're facing uh, in our industry, in our lives, and, um, and the advantages that we face uh, during this time and the disadvantages that we face all the time. Um, and uh, I'm just excited to um, get to know all the folks that are here uh, in the room with us today and especially in this time uh, and especially in this time when uh, we see uh, a, a huge um, movement for Black Lives Matter uh, and, uh, and, and even yesterday in New York we saw a huge march for uh, Black trans lives uh, it was really exciting uh, to see uh, large groups of people speaking out for, um, for Black lives and for Black trans lives. And so um, I'm happy today to have um, voices uh, of artists uh, who, can, who can speak to that too. And so as a white trans person, I'm going to uh, stop talking and, um, and pass the baton to uh, my other amazing fellow artists who are here today to talk about their stories. And, um, uh, and, and I would like to introduce, a, well, myself first, I guess a little bit is, my name is Andy Lee Carter and I'm a playwright, composer and lyricist. And I'd like to introduce my co-moderator, um, Marik. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I think, you know, we're excited to have this conversation today with you all um, and really to hear from folks who are watching and the participants as well, like what your questions are. So just to kind of do a quick overview of the structure, we're going to spend some time in the beginning um, learning about who we all are and our, you know, our intro is a little bit about our background with like theater and artistic work. Um, and then obviously probably what brought us to this journey in some way. And then we're gonna go into two prompts that are pretty open-ended, um, share those. We're gonna ask those questions. We're gonna spend, spend about 30 minutes doing that. And then we're gonna have actually 15 minutes at the end specifically for you all as participants, as audience to ask questions to us here. Um, and so that's kind of the name of the game. Um, we're gonna go ahead and uh, do intros as well. So I will share a little bit about more about myself afterwards, but my name is Marique Jensen, uh, pronouns are she, her. I'm located in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, so yeah, <laughs> um, so definitely Midwest. Uh, I spent about 10 years in Chicago um, and I'm from St. Louis originally. Um, and uh, so name, pronouns, location, identify as a trans woman um, or a woman of trans experience. And uh, in terms of my racial ethnic identity, my dad is white. Uh, my mom's family is Mexican. I'm second generation. And then far back from there, there's Lebanese as well. So um, that's a little bit about sort of my identity. I would love for the panelists to share a little bit about who you are. Um, and then also like what brings you to this work as like trans artists, as trans theater artists. Um, so let's go ahead and, and kick it off. Who wants to go first? And also as we do that um, for both our panelists and our attendees in the chat, uh, you can maybe check in with how we're feeling today, like a one word check-in, just to say one word, you can pop in the chat, like how you're feeling as we're introducing ourselves. So. How about Ian? Would you like to introduce yourself? <laughs> sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Ian Field Stewart. I use they, them, she, her pronouns. I'm a Black, queer, trans feminine storyteller working at the intersection of theater and activism. I am also the founder of the Oka Project. We are a collective 
that hires black trans chefs to cook for black trans people in their homes or in community centers if they're currently experiencing homelessness. Obviously, we're not able to do that work right now. So we've created the Nina Pop Mental Health Recovery Fund and the Tony McDade Mental Health Recovery Fund dedicated to um, providing one time 100% free mental health uh, therapy sessions for all black trans people who are uh, protesting or mourning um, the violence that our community faces. I am an actress, a singer, a dancer, a playwright, um, and I am very tired. Great. Um, Azure? Okay, great. Hi, um, I'm Azure D. Osborne Lee. I'm looking at my notes here. My pronouns are he, him, and they, them. I'm located in Brooklyn, New York right now. Um, and I, ID as a theater maker. I'm the founder of Roots and River Productions, which is uh, a production company that focuses on the work of Black artists, particularly queer and trans artists. Um, so that's a thing. I work primarily as a playwright right now, but um, I'm also a performer. Occasionally I direct. Um, I've also been known to show up in other people's disciplines. So I've done some dance work, video work, like whatever. If you're trying to pay, I might could do it. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> and um, last but not least, Dylan. Um, hello, my name is Dylan Iruegas. My pronouns are he, him, his, or él si hablas español. Um, I am currently calling in from the Massachusetts and Wampanoag lands, also known as Boston, Massachusetts. Um, although I am originally from the central Texas area, known as both the Tonkawan and um, Kotikwan uh, lands, I um, I am of both mixed Guatiquan and uh, white settler in, uh, um, ancestries. Um, and as a theater maker, um, I am, I usually just say theater maker because just like Azure said, it's like, if you pay me enough, I can probably do it. <laughs> but I am primarily an actor, um, director, and playwright. And currently I am the fellow for the HowlRound Theater Commons. Amazing. And also, uh, because I forgot to say it, um, I am on occupied Lenape land, otherwise known as New York City. Thank you. As am I. Also, my racial identity is Black. I'm Black, y'all. I'm Black American. My people are from the South. I'm from round about these here parts. Thank you. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much for uh, sharing who you are and what your work is um, for your introductions to yourselves. Um, so uh, we'd like to open up with uh, some- Andy, Andy can, do, yes. you wanna share, do you wanna share a little bit about sort of your background and- I Oh guess yeah, I guess, I, I mean, I talked about the panel but I didn't really say about me. Yeah, who Hi, are you? I'm, I'm Andy Lee, um, my pronouns are he, they, and I am um, a recent graduate of the NYU musical theater writing program. Um, so uh, I've got a very expensive uh, degree in an industry that is like on pause for the next infinity. So that's great. Um, but I'm excited to be uh, wor working on uh, different platforms and in different ways um, and, uh, and I've actually had some projects that have gotten more press during this time than I did when I was in the real world. Um, and I've been, um, uh, do it, flexing my muscles more as a composer since I've gotten out of school where I was a words person. Um, so, uh, and my work focuses a lot on identity and um, the trans experience. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Um, again, I'm Marique. Uh, I spent most of my adult life in Chicago. Um, I was involved with About Face Youth Theater when I was younger, so LGBT theater company. 
um, doing like ethnographic storytelling. And that kind of was a catalyst for me in terms of looking at how to do storytelling work within communities that I have membership in. Um, so I uh, really, as an anthropologist as well, I'm an artist, anthropologist, um, activist. Uh, hey, intern at About Face, Gregory. Um, uh, I, you know, ethnogra ethnogra ethnographic uh, storytelling is something I'm really interested in. And so actually, um, double majored in women and gender studies and uh, anthropology. And part of my thesis was doing a longitudinal ethnographic study on um, uh, self-identified effeminate gay men in America. That was a project called 50 Faggots. And so it was a documentary series that aired back in 2010. Um, and then from that, I actually started my own LGBT multimedia company um, and doing storytelling work. And so when I moved to Kansas City, um, that actually became really critical um, in a time where I arrived to build a multi-statewide LGBT with anti-violence program because um, uh, I've been doing anti-violence work as well. It's part of my background with young people. And it, four months into arriving, there was the first of a wave of homicides towards trans and uh, non-binary people of color. And so storytelling actually became something that was really important to activating communities and also building programs and summits um, and, and getting the media to just respond to the violence that was happening. Um, so I'm sure I can share more about that at some point too, um, but I'm really excited to hear from you all. So yeah, thank you. Andy, go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off. I just oh, wanted no, to- Oh, no, thank you. I appreciate that. You thank are. you for sharing what, what you're up to as well. Um, and uh, yeah, so the first question besides introducing ourselves that I wanted to ask is, um, what are some of the biggest challenges that you are facing in telling your stories and what are the biggest joys? So it's a two-parter a two question that I'd like to put forward uh, to you all. Um, and anyone can go in any order, there's not a... <laughs> so feel free to... I'll take the lead. All right, um, of course. Uh, can you repeat the question one more time? Yes, please? the question are, what are the biggest challenges you face in telling your stories? And what are your biggest joys? Um, there are challenges to telling a story as a Black trans person in any space because um, we face things like, such as what I'm facing this morning with uh, my landlord continuing to threaten me and my roommates with uh, police if we do not um, acquiesce to certain desires. There's the reality of walking down the street of a Black trans as a Black trans woman and sort of um, the difficulties that that faces. Um, so there are very, very real everyday struggles to um, creating and producing, uh, in, in especially in a capitalist society that asks us to constantly be producing and creating, even if we don't have the capacity for it. Um, so I think that, that is, that's this first struggle that has to be named as far as just means and modes of survival for Black trans people. I think is pretty um, is a pretty large struggle to creating and generating um, narrative work. Um, as far as institutionally, I think that um, as an actress, I often face the the difficulty of trying to um, be seen, genuinely, just be seen in the room for roles that I'm right for. Um, whether it be like I um, I'm a non-binary queer woman, um, but my non-binaryness is often invisible to many people. Uh, um, and you just, you know, since beginning medical transitioning, uh, have often just been read as a, read, read as a woman, um, which is totally fine by me. Uh, but I think that uh, something that is a bit of a struggle is trying to like walk into rooms and ask to be seen for roles that aren't necessarily written as trans. Um, which is not to say that those roles that are specifically written as trans are lesser than. I'm perfectly happy to play trans the rest of my life because I think that trans is, um, my transness makes me closer to divinity as does my blackness. So I have no issue with, you know, I don't feel a need to leave either of them outside of the room. Uh, there is, but there is also the reality that, um, that we, that until, until the industry shifts and more roles are created, our divinity cannot be represented if we're not allowed to take up space wherever we deserve to take up space. Women of all experiences deserve to have a shot at that audition and at that space. Um, and so those are sort of the, the challenges that I faced as far as what um, the, I think you also asked what, what has made it easy to produce work, is that right? What, what brings you joy? What brings me joy? What, what brings me joy is um, I, 
I derive great joy from um, pissing off white people for white cis hats for the sake of my black trans community and my family. Um, it brings me great joy to um, occupy a space and to be um, a loud, problematic, and annoying black woman who refuses to be silenced. That's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, great. That same question to any, anyone else who wants to jump. Um, okay, I'll go. So, um, challenges, gosh, sometimes it feels like, you know, working in and loving the theater industry is nothing but challenges, uh, because of the way that it's been set up and the, you know, like the way that our society runs. Um, so, you know, from something as simple as my racist high school never casting me in a single play, despite the fact that I auditioned for almost sing every single one, all four years. Um, and then on my last day at the school, the director of the program had the nerve to catch me on my way to my car and say, oh, I'm just so sorry it never worked out with any of those shows. Um, yeah, so, so there's that. Um, I guess, you know, what I've been grappling with is what success looks like, you know, when somebody decides that they're into your work, into your story, um, you know, generally that means that some white person somewhere said yes and convinced some other white people to say yes and give you resources. Um, but then what does that mean? You know, like, are they there to consume my work, to consume me? Um, you know, like, what does it mean when people who have no sort of relationship to my work or the identities I present, decide to speak on that work as if they were some sort of <laughs> authority, you know, and make some sort of judgment. Um, so I think that for me, a big challenge has been um, being able to enjoy a certain amount of success as an artist and still be able to uh, connect to my communities, right? Because that's, that's the thing that brings me the most joy is being able to curate a space and curate um, a feeling, right? Um, any space that I'm putting together as a producer, uh, you know, I do my best to make it a healing and joyful space. Um, one in which people are challenged to bring their artistic best, you know, but also understand that they are being brought into the room as they are. Um, because they are more than enough. And that's what I was lucky enough to experience with Daniel Alexander Jones and Sharon Bridgeforth when I still lived in Austin, Texas. You know, a moment of just being brought into the space and being challenged um, lovingly, you know. So you can cry all you want, but you better say your lines. <laughs> now come on and let's have some chicken. You know, like that's how I was brought up as a theater artist. And that's still what I strive for. Um, you know, so I guess this tension between like artistry and community, you know, like what is that, what does that mean? Um, that's a challenge and a joy. One oh, more. I have one more joy. I love getting to pay my people. I love getting yes. to pay my people. Anytime you can ask anyone, I stay on that Pentacles magic. I'm on the hotline. I'm a grant maker. I'm an administrator. I'm asking where the money at, where the money coming. Who can we give the money to? Black people, queer people, black trans people. I love paying my people and you should too. Yes, very true. Um, Dylan? Dude, yeah, um, so I think one of my biggest challenges so far is um, going from a very specific localized uh, theater scene of like being in Austin because I, I lived there for 10 years before moving to Boston and so kind of going from like such a localized scene and like making sure local voices are heard and then now being a little bit more on the national international scale um, and trying to see where I can allocate the resources and um, all of my knowledge sharing out into the broader community um, and trying to you know, for keep keep doing like commenting and and making sure that everything is shared within everyone. Um, that that's a very like personal thing that I'm, or business wise of of a job of what I'm having. And then as far as like actual work, um, 
is decentering my voice um, in a way of like my of acting of my playwriting of like yes I do have things to say and like having my intersectioning marginalized identities do matter but then also understanding that like I'm not the only voice in the room that needs to be heard others do as well um, and learning from devising experiences and um, trainings and stuff like that and so just kind of like shifting and essentially decolonizing my brain and like not having that shame like like you were saying Azure um, of of having these experiences with everybody and making sure yeah we're, we're all doing the work um, and not yeah not holding on to that shame and trying to focus more on the decolonization and and the people and yeah everyone that's a long run on sentence i will end it there <laughs> um yeah and then i guess like a big part of that joy then is like realizing that i am a part of a broader and larger community that because like in 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 my home hometown in my college town in my artistic home a lot of the times I was that only person in the room who held multiple marginalized identities. And so it, it wasn't often the case. So like, I won't say like, I, I was the only one, blah, blah, blah. Like that wasn't true. There were often others, but it was more often than not, unfortunately. Um, and so then um, coming into a broader perspective of like, oh wait, I am a part of a broader community, a broader artistic community. And I'm able to reach out to others to make these connections and for us to be able to help each other um, like succeed and be the best people that we can have, can be, and to live the fullest lives that we can. Thank you so much for sharing that. So y'all were so motivating that Chad, meanwhile, has started a movement. And I just want to just share his comment because I, I love it. He said, can I suggest that those of us who are benefiting from the honesty intelligence of these artists donate to their organizations? So there is a call out already the plate has been passed for potentially some funds. So um, I think at the end, we can certainly share that, but I would say y'all get your links together and get ready to drop them. Because at some point, we definitely want to take advantage of that. And thank you for sharing that. It's really important to support trans artists. And I also just want to highlight on the fact that you all spoke about this amazing resilience that you're doing, where you are basically creating these paths and these avenues you're like it doesn't exist i may not have necessarily got it in the full way that i needed but i'm doing it for my community and i just want to like really give props for that and share that that in of itself is is phenomenal and amazing so thank you for doing that work all right so do you guys have any questions for each other based off like what y'all shared is there anything that you wanted to know more about or you're like ooh, let's touch on that more there were some, uh, some it definitely some of the stuff you re said resonated with folks in the chat. So I just wanted to kind of highlight on that as well. I will say it's a bit of an unfair advantage because I know both, both of these lovely humans personally. So well, that's good. You can that ask for them, them we don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What, what do we need to know? What, what's the Absolutely. question now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just met Dellen. Um, this month, this past month, because um, he was in a reading of one of my plays. Um, and so that's been really lovely getting to connect across, you know, cyberspace. Um, but I'll also, I just want to touch on what Ian said at the beginning. You know, I'm tired. You know, people like emailing me, asking me for things. Please just think, think about it. You know, uh, like, why now? Is this important now? Is this a significant opportunity? Which includes the question, how much am I paying, right? And how much work are you actually asking me to do? Because I don't know how y'all feel, but like as a playwright, I have work that's like ready for you to look at. You know, I've got enough stuff in my archive that you can be consuming my work without me having to do anything right now. Right now I'm trying to get, you know, a chile relleno burrito and like chill out maybe with a negro modelo and just like try to to you know weather this craziness and also support my community as best i can um i guess the next thing that i'll say is that i think as far as um 
I, I am definitely moving into um, a place where um, the only modes and modalities that I'm really interested in are solution-based um, in regards to at least um, anti-racism work. Uh, I think that um, the reality of undoing racism is that it requires me, or the reality of undoing um, transphobia, the undoing of these things, um, the reality of it is that it requires me to sit at the table with people that I do not consider to be part of my community, nor do I consider to be um, the people that I want to be speaking to. Um, my, um, and so I think that the reality of asking any black person to sit at the table and undo racism, and uh, the reality of having any trans person sit at the table and ask them to undo transphobia, when both of these things are um, institutions that were never created for or by us and are certainly not upheld by us, um, although there are some who try. Um, you know, uh, I think that it is important that we recognize that um, we have we have reached a point where conversation is no longer necessary and actionable steps is all that's required. Because the reality is that it's just not that difficult. Um, it's as simple as asking institutions the simple question of, will you commit as a theatrical company to casting and hiring 50 to 75% trans artists around, uh, across the board in your creative teams, as well as in, your, in, in, the, in, in the actors that you hire? Are you willing to create a community board that has equal voting status to your current board of directors who will be able to, who, will, who is made up of the majority black, queer, trans people, the, the communities that you say you serve, do they have an active role and voice and vote in how you move and, and do your work? The questions are very simple and the solutions are actually quite simple as well. Um, so I think that I am reaching a point where conversation is no longer interesting to me. The only conversation I'm interested in having is where I ask the question, are you willing to do this? Are you willing to undo, to do this? And if the answer is no, then I need to go. Um, and so I think that, uh, I just wanna bring that into the space that I think that as we are seeing um, in the streets and um, I can't speak to the politic of everyone gathered both in the comments and in here, but um, my personal politic is that I value life over buildings. And so if, if cities must be brought to the ground then they must be brought to the ground because human life is too important. And I don't care if it's one life or 17 lives, I don't require footage, I don't require links or articles to tell me that institutions need to be brought to the heels. So for me, I think that this moment that we are in, both in recognizing um, how our government has handled um, COVID-19, as well as, um, I mean, highlighting the fact that curfews only became a thing once black people returned to the streets. Um, I think that uh, seeing how action is, is operating now, I think that we in the theatrical community need to follow suit and we need to have actionable conversations and action oriented conversations that are, that if they do not result in action are kept very brief and certainly do not involve anyone like me. Well, you're ready for your TED talk. Thank you. That was amazing. That was, people are living in the chat box. So thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing that. That was so, so important. Um, you, you all have touched on this. Um, and so I wanted just to kind of expand on, Andy and I were, actually was a question that we had come up with that it works really well. So the next question we were gonna ask you all would be what types of trans and gender expansive art and narratives do we want to see flourish in the theater and artistic communities? So I'll go ahead and drop that question as well in the chat box. But again, what types of trans and gender expansive art um, and narratives do we wanna see flourish in our communities? So whoever wants to take it over. Y'all have been really talking about that already. Yeah. Um, so I'll take a crack at this. Um, I just want to sort of circle back around to what I was saying before, and I think also touch on what Yam was saying. You know, when we say flourish, like, what do we mean? Um, when I first moved to New York City in 2009, I just came, you know, as a 24-year-old with my suitcase and was like, I want a life in the theater, you know, and then I realized that I was not being nearly specific enough. 
you can have any kind of life in the theater. You can be selling those candy bars. You could be cleaning up those Hamilton cups that people throw on the ground. You could be, you know, doing any kind of work. So I had to get much more specific about what I wanted to do. And um, I think in that way, you know, I've realized that my ask as a playwright has to be more specific. So no, I don't just want a production. Like I need you, like this is a theater takeover now. If you're doing my work, like we're in here, right? So like, I'm getting the director that I want. Like I'm getting the producers that I want. We're connecting to the community. Like I need to see, because I'm a spreadsheet queen, you know, like that's the thing. People always, they don't recognize who they're talking to. I'm like, honey, I know how to work the box office software. I need to see all the printouts. I need to see the manifest where the coupon, you know, codes that you're using. How are you distributing those? Like, what are the postcards? What are these little stickers that you're putting on there? I need to see the spreadsheet. Like, how did you get these numbers, et cetera, et cetera. Like, you know, and for better or for worse, I've learned to do that because of lack of resources on my end. But, um, you know, when we're talking about putting on art and the art is flourishing, again, this needs to be a takeover. I need to see my people in the house, like, regularly. And I don't mean like a little sprinkling, like a chocolate chip cookie. No, like, this is, this is a whole new situation. And you need to embrace that, be ready for that, and joyful about that, right? Like, that's, that's what's happening. If this is the work that you really say that you love and you want to invest in, then you need to be ready to become that, right? Isn't that what we do here in the theater? So again, yeah, I mean, I've been saying for years, because of my background in arts administration, one programmatic year, one fiscal year, that's all you need to make a change, right? So if I keep hearing you saying the same things again and spinning it, and it's been honestly more than like half a fiscal year, then like you're really not about that business. You're not about that work. Um, and I just need to see, like, I need to see that it's real for you before I can invest because my time is too precious. My energy is too precious. Um, and so are my people's, right? Like I'm not gonna drag them into your space so that they can have a whack ass time so that you can you know victimize them tell them they can't use the bathroom that day or whatever it is um so yeah everything needs to be together great any anything to add to that from yeah yeah um so definitely yeah, echoing on the on the takeover thing, but also like don't make us be your tokens. Like don't like have your like, oh, we did the trans play, so we're done. Um, and not do like any of the work behind of like what is the actual experience for trans folks when they enter into your spaces. Like, I mean, also like one, like, I don't care about your spaces, like I'm trying to create my own goodbye. But if we are going to be in them, yeah, make sure that the the full experience is there so that the takeover is there. So I definitely like do that but also like don't have it be just the one show like Ian was saying like you need to make it like more of your um uh like yeah 50 to 75 percent of the people working for you of the people who are consistently with you like this isn't just like a one time okay yeah we did it and we're done pat on the back here we go like no that is not going to like create systemic change as we know as we have been saying and so yeah to like have those like actionable actionable things happen um, and then, like, also, like, on the, on the other side of, like, wanting to see, like, if it's flourishing, like, if, say, everything, everything is met, we are, like, living in a wonderful, wonderful, like, oasis of everything is perfect. Um, I would love to see shows about mundanity, like, trans folks just living their lives joyously and just going through their day to day and, like, maybe the biggest thing that happens is like, oh, this person is going through a breakup, but it's not necessarily about their transness, it's just about whatever it is. Because we have plenty of white shows that are doing that. We have plenty of other like cishet shows that are doing that. Why like, why do all of the trans shows and all of the like trans, black trans shows and the POC black trans shows all have to be centered around our transition? And why do we all have to die or suffer the most? No, we don't. We need to like celebrate and have our joy just as much as like any other shows can have. Um, I will say that I am craving shows that 
encourage euphoria and deconstructs dysphoria. I crave shows that, um, that remember that um, sexual orientation and gender identity are two different things. Um, I crave seeing two black, black trans women making out on stage and being in love on stage. I crave seeing um, a, a black trans man, um, you know, face, face off with, you know, an aggressor and beat that aggressor down. I crave um, seeing a, a black trans woman shove her heel into a cop's knee. I, I crave um, seeing the type of resilience that I have seen every day of my life and that I exude every day of my life be mirrored back to me on stage rather than this watered down um, sort of carbon copy narrative that tells me that I am always in trauma, I am always lesser than, I am always um, craving space and never taking it up. Um, and so I think for me, uh, for me, what I just crave, I just crave shows that just make me feel like, yes, like I wanna hear like my people in the audience responding, living, um, getting their life. I want, I want us to recognize that um, many of the things we were taught in college are things that abuelas and grandmamas knew in the hood. And so all of these, all of this EDI work, that's, it's really just hood mentality that's being, that's been colonized and is pimped out to various collegiate institutions to wake to wake us up, and I and the, and I am very much a part of that. And you know, coming from Birmingham, Alabama, and being raised by a white woman and a white family, and recognizing that for me, blackness was something I had to figure out for myself um, and come to on my own, and that will always be a part of my journey. Um, but also recognizing that um, that the real art, the real work, the real um, philosophies have been have been set in place long before us by the very people that we don't that we don't allow to come into the theater because they're too poor and so I think recognizing that like our culture and our art comes from those people is the first step in recognizing the ways that we need to shift how we tell stories and so that's what I pray I love it I love all of it um, I would I would add that I I spent a lot of years for myself um, in gay male world. Um, it never fit, never worked for me, but I was always like, I, got, I guess this is what it is. Um, and I always wanted to, uh, I always felt like I knew being a trans woman would be hard. And so I really wanted to like, feel like I gave it my all. And that's of course not how it works. You know, like that's not, you know, it's cute. That's not really how it works. So then as soon as you transition, you're like, oh my gosh, I'm so much happier. But I have found in the world that I existed in that was primarily gay men running bars, running Boys Town, running the theater, um, exploiting stories to make money off of it, um, that I have a challenge specifically for LGBTQ folks and specifically for um, white gay men and white lesbian women or queer women that... I have found them almost to be gatekeepers that are harder to move um, and harder to budge on than it is for cis folks. I feel like cis folks are like, we don't know anything, teach us everything. And you're like, okay, this is annoying, but I can work with you easier than I can with like gay men or lesbian women who feel the need to, um, to kind of all explain away sort of why they're doing the, what they do or how hard they've had to work to get to where they are. Um, and so one of the things that I did um, and I started for myself was, you know, a um, kind of like a pop-up resource fair that was also a place where queer and trans people of color who are artists were getting paid. And I did that through this Get Woke series, which kind of has toured in Kansas City and around the country. And we really believed in paying folks for their time, energy, and wisdom and celebrating that resiliency and getting to those moments, um, Ian, that you were talking about that are like the snaps, the yeses, the like the moments that are about excitement. Because one of the things that we realized was that 
queer and trans folks of color, especially folks um, that are undocumented, especially like black folks, um, have so much pain and trauma that are that are that are we carry that are with us, right? That sometimes um, we just need to get up and move. So, like, how do we actually activate movement where we're dancing to house music that speaks to us and that was made for us, or where, um, you know, yes, we're working through PTSD, um, and so those are things that I, you know, I want to see more of. I want to see you all have the opportunity to shine and tell your stories and be supported in that way. I also found in the theater world that it seems that it's really easy to workshop trans stuff, especially if it's trans people of color, you workshop it and you, you put it out there and you test it and it doesn't get the same support as like white cis folks or like a white gay man can be doing like really bad, uh, I'm not gonna call anyone out, but it could do like really bad like drag makeup. And then they're like, oh, this is innovative. This is amazing. Let's make this like the show. And you're like, girl, like, you know what I mean? Like just some of that stuff I think um, doesn't exist. The support doesn't exist in the same way for um, people of color, for, for trans people of color. And so um, I just wanted to name that too, that even when we do see it come up, it's put into a place of like, you still have to prove these certain things before that support will fully be given there. I'd like to also add, um, this is just for context of sort of my own uh, experiences of working in nonprofit theatrical spaces and particularly in the arts admin world. Um, the last, probably ever, theater company that I ever worked for in that capacity, um, they scheduled a show into their season that had not been written yet. And it was this, I think it was the first show of their season and it had not been written yet. And when I came on and began developing work around, developing like attention around that show, it had 10 pages that had been written. And so I wanna be very clear. And so I bring that up because I wanna be very clear that that will never, never happen for a black trans artist unless Laverne Cox maybe writes it. And even then, I don't think that they'll just allow her to do that. So I just wanna be very clear about the fact that it's like, these theaters are very much have their favorites and they treat them accordingly. And the level, like, and they'll do things like that, but we'll never read the work of staff members, interns, people who are actively working every day for them and we'll never read their plays, even when they tell them to send, to send your plays along. So I just wanna be very clear about that, that like these theaters absolutely have access and the ability to tell our stories and actively choose not to. And I think that we need to make sure that we're never sort of um, functioning this as like, they don't have enough information from us or, oh, if we just like work hard enough, we'll be able to like work our way into their eyes and into their good graces. They don't care about good graces. They don't even care about the content because they can schedule an entire season that starts off with content that hasn't been written yet. You know what I'm saying? So I just want to be very clear about like, about that aspect. Like if, you are, if you're ever hearing like, we don't know where the money is. We don't know, like, we don't know where this is. We don't know where that is. Isn't it actually about any of that? It's about, they haven't tried. My organization started the Nina Pop Fund and the Tony McDade Fund on Sunday. This morning, we just raised $120,000. And that's based purely off of individual donations to um, a PayPal through Twitter. I haven't sent one email to not know what, nobody's grant, nobody's nothing. So there's no excuse. There's no excuse. The money is there. Just make it happen. You know, and I, I, wanna, I wanna both totally like just give you all the accolades for that amazing grassroots organizing that you're doing. And also just share, I know in the Midwest and in a place like Kansas City, that is nearly impossible. Like I hear that and I'm like, oh my gosh, like that to me feels so big city, you know? And I say that as somebody who lived in a big city, like that feels like something that I would not see happen for trans, like if trans women of color, and it's happened in Kansas City, we've been one of the epicenters of violence towards trans women of color being murdered in this country. Um, and we don't see that kind of turnout or support. I mean, it is like, we can put those donation links up there and we still don't have that kind of support. So I feel like that is what 
I want the experience to be across the board and more, right? I want you to still have access to those grants and those funding. Um, and for folks like us, I'm wondering too, like, and I know people are watching this from across the country, I just want to name too that like in rural environments and places that I think get coastal neglect, so not LA, not New York, not Miami, not San Francisco, um, it, it is a lot harder, I think, in some ways to even just get people to care, get people to wake up. Um, and so thank you for sharing that and speaking about that. Do we, okay, so we, um, we can move on to uh, yeah. questions from the audience. Exactly. There's, okay, so I've kind of curated like a lot of the questions into one big question because a lot of the questions are the same question. Um, so the question is, um, what can theater people do to support trans artists and black trans artists? Um, well, basically that's it. It's just like, what, what can cis people do? Like what, like what can organizations do? What can costume designers do? What can artistic directors do? What can higher education uh, uh, settings do? Like every question is like a different iteration of what can we do? So that's, that's, main, that's, what, that's the main big question. There's a couple other questions that I'll ask, but I think that's the, the big one. And I have a very simple response. Do it. Yeah. It's as simple as that. Support because it. either there are trans people who are in the room or there aren't. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an easy answer, I think. Well, uh, you know, I mean, I'll go on to say it. <laughs> well, yeah, but I'll go on to say, you know, to mirror that back. Well, what can you do, right? And like, I know people, <laughs> I know people hate that. I know they hate it. I majored in English. I know they hate stuff like that. But the thing is, like, what you got, you know, like, what what are you offering, you know? Um, if you're new, I saw somebody say, you know, like, what what advice would you give to people like fresh out of like undergrad? Um, you know, my my company, Roots and River Productions, started out um, based on a mentorship program for uh, QTPOC people. Like, basically, I knew a bunch of queer and trans, mostly Black, people coming out of um, school. And I decided, because for me, that was a really hard time to stay connected to my artistry, because in a lot of ways, you're just like, what even is life when you, if you've just gone straight from high school to college? Um, and so what I did was link those um, artists who had just graduated up with artists who had already been working in the community to kind of share those resources and um, and ensure, you know, which includes, as Ian was saying earlier, just like basic like living advice, right? Like, <laughs> you know, like, how do you live in this geographic area? Like, where do you get your hair done? You know, like, Where's the shea butter at? Like, these are very important questions that need to be answered so that people can make their art, right? <laughs> so um, I think it's okay to reach out to people who you see doing the thing, but also understand that they may not have the time for you, right? In which case, um, you know, I really uh, encourage organizations and people with resources to um, to distribute those resources so that more time can be made, right? Like if we're talking about time is money, then making sure to compensate people um, often opens up that availability, right? Oh, um, Peter, Peter J. Quo said something very important too in the comments. Cis people also need to make sure that spaces are safe for trans individuals. So we're not continuously harming them when we're invited that when we're inviting them into our space, trans awareness training for staff and artists. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think a lot of um, a lot of what these where these questions come from for me just remind me a lot of like white folk asking black folk to do all the work for them. Cis yeah. people, y'all, there's a thing called Google. Y'all can look it up. We had there are plenty of resources. Like I did not like have the luxury of having like trans people around like I did not know what a trans person was until I was age of 18 and outside of my parents house so like if I can do the work for myself and like figure out my identity and all that sort of stuff y'all can do it too it's not that hard there are plenty 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 of resources out there I will definitely uphold um, one right now that um, is at top of mind because I do work for HowlRound 
Um, we, we do have um, an article um, that was created by Gender Explosion, um, which is um, a, a group started by Stage Source here in the Boston area. Um, and they uh, wrote an article called Beyond the Bathrooms. And it's like how to make a trans, like a trans, people, trans people safe within a theater. They're very step-by-step. -step. Look that one up, have fun with it. Also, Haron has plenty of other things of articles to look up. So like y'all just do the work yourself and stop relying on trans folks to do the work for you. Yeah, I would add to that, that um, yeah, uh, any group that is marginalized has had to do so much work. Um, and so I would just say that, you know, people who haven't had that experience and want to learn more about that group also have to do that work because the people that are doing, that are living that life that is marginalized have had to do so much work because they have to live it and they have to figure out how to live that life. And they've already, they've had to do the work because they have no other choice. But if you don't live that life, then, then, and you want to know more about it, that you still have to do the work. I'll also add that I think that um, just a small bit, the more work you do to understand the things that you have that make you privileged, the more you will understand and be able to empathize with what it would be like to not have that privilege. Thank um, you. I, oh, I was just gonna say, you know, um, it's also important to mention, because this usually comes up on our panels, you know, we see each other around the way. Um, listen, not every person of any marginalized identity has signed up to be a teacher or a coach. That being said, some of us have. So you can also pay a consultant, right? Like, don't ask me for free, ask somebody else for money and they will do it. Um, and the other thing I wanna say is, if you really wanna get rad with it, quit your job, right? Artistic director, do we really need you? Or can we have guest curators for each season? Yeah, give up your job, go do something else, find yourself in a garden, you know, like, I'm over it give up your job, give it to somebody else if you really want to see us, like, get ahead. And, um, yeah, let's just completely change the way that we've been doing change things. The system. Like, I, I think Ian kind of said it before, like, people, the people, it, putting the right, different people in power, you know, putting, putting Black people, putting trans people in the positions of power is, that's, that's the way things are changing. As long as the same people, as long as the same people are holding the, you know, the keys to the gate, then the same things are going to continue to be the same. I love it. I love it. Um, so Josh has been having their hand up under the chat box. I love that you use the hand. Oh, so school of you, uh, Josh. What is your question? Oh wait, I don't know how to. How do we do it? I don't know how to do it. I think the host has to do it. Oh, I think it, Josh, you can probably just type it in there. We'll give that a second. It says talking permitted. Oh, oh, there it is. Oh, oh Josh, have a question. <laughs> all right. Well, that's all right. Well, Okay, so I think that, there's another, there's one other big question mm -hmm. that I think would be interesting to hear from everyone or, or anyone is um, what are some of your favorite plays or works um, that could include your own um, that you'd like to talk about or promote or artists um, that I, I would love to know who inspires you um, and who you'd like to lift up. And can we, Andy, can we go yeah. to that question in a second? Because I, oh, I sure. want to, I, I feel like, I feel like that might be a faster answer than the other one. Yeah. I do want to just take time to give space um, to the folks who identify as Black to talk about what you all are feeling right now yeah. in the wake yeah. of everything happening, right? So I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to roll over that. If no, you don't no. want to share, if you're like, I'm good, I don't want to talk about it, that's fine. But if you want to share some things, because I know that 
you all especially probably are feeling a lot of things. And I don't know if you have some wisdom you want to share, if you have things that you want to talk about. So I just wanted to kind of give space for that before we go into that question, um, because I have a feeling if you do share, you might need more time on what you're going to share. Um, okay, I'll say something. I Right now, you know, it's just really overwhelming, you know, like what I want most is to, I mean, justice, uh, always, <laughs> you know, but um, it's to spend time with my loved ones, with my community, you know, to feel like my loved ones and my community are safe, um, as safe as we can be right now. Um, I feel excited and inspired, but I am also really exhausted and, you know, like afraid. Just, just a lot of feelings. So that's all I'm going to say about that. It's beyond words. Yeah, and I just want to thank Thank you both for, for being here. And uh, uh, yeah, I, it's, um, we're, we're honored to have you and we love you. So, um, and, I, and I would love to hear who, who in, inspires you um, because that is um, something that, you know, I, I wanna read more plays by black trans artists and um and and be inspired by by everyone that that surrounds me you know um azure inspires me <laughs> uh uh i think i like to think that i inspire myself at times um uh, yeah, I think I, for me, it, it goes back to the fact that a lot of my inspiration doesn't come from how we write about ourselves, but how we live ourselves. And so I think that more often than not, the people that inspire me are like the Black trans women that I'm surrounded by, the Black organizers that I'm surrounded by. Much of my work is grounded in activism. so. Um, a lot of my inspiration is not derived from the theater. I, I never meant to be any kind of writer. I, I mean, when I, let, when I was 18 and heading off to college and just a little black girl from Birmingham, Alabama, all I dreamed of was the big Broadway stage. And, you know, five years into living in New York, um, have realized how uninterested I am in the work that Broadway puts on stage or that, or that Broadway considers valuable. Um, so I think that for me, I, I don't, I don't tend to derive much, um, which is not to say that the work is not inspiring, that there are not incredible artists out there because there are the, you know, the two people that, I, the, the four people that I'm with today being demonstrations of that. Um, but I don't, I think, I, I believe very heavily in the importance of having a life and an interest outside of the theater. And so... I don't think, like, none of my inspiration, none of the words that I write down would happen if I didn't, you know, when I get inspired, it's just like, I'm usually just like have this phone right here, and I'm just in the middle of a conversation, someone says something hilarious, or someone says something wild, or an idea just comes to me, and I'm just like, and I just type it in the little notes on my phone. So I don't know that I can say that, um, I don't know that I can say that, that there are like, um, a specific artist who inspire me in specific ways. Um, I'm inspired by, Black trans people who exist and Black trans people who are no longer with us. Um, but I think, you know, if, let me, I will just say it like this, if you don't have a Black trans person in your life, um, you should, if, you know, if, they, if they're interested in that because um, they're pretty phenomenal. Okay, so, um, yeah. I mean, I feel like right now I inspire myself, you know, like I had this moment, you know, like theater, my 
my show Mirrors got canceled in the middle of its world premiere uh, because of the pandemic. And so that was quite the moment for me. Um, and uh, I just had my first reading of a play like out after the pandemic, that was Beasts of Warren, which Dylan was in um, with the Austin Scottish Rite Theater. Um, and it was really nice revisiting my work, but also like, I just really love my community, you know, of like queer and trans black folks, people of color, and like, yeah, sometimes cishets too, but only the ones who are the most down and the most like open to learn. And then they're really privileged to be in the space, right? And they know that. Um, if they don't know that, then they should, right? Um, and yeah, like that's, that's what I truly love about theater and its potential. It's just like all of this lovely, I don't even know how to explain it. Like if you've never been in a space that it just feels like you're just like working your hardest and loving on each other and like you're feeling really fulfilled and present, then I, I hope one day you get to experience that. Um, I think, and I have experienced that most often in my community, like with people like me. Thank you guys for sharing that, or thank you all for sharing that. Um, Andy, let's go back to the question that you asked. Um, yeah, so what are some of your favorite uh, plays or works? Um, any Anything that you would recommend for folks to read? Mirrors by Asher. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> So yeah, there's this thing called National New Play Exchange where you can go and read people's work. Um, I have a profile on there. You can find it linked in my website. Like, there's a page where you can go and read things. Um, yeah, I read plays. I mean, you should be reading plays if you're, if you're making theater and you don't read a lot of plays. You should read a lot of plays and you should read plays by people who are not like you, right? And you can go find those people on National New Play. Yes network exchange exchange right um but i also yeah. really love reading um books right so nk jemison like inspires me a lot and that's my plug look her up she's a black woman she lives in uh brooklyn right amazing sci-fi and fantasy featuring black folks yes the new play exchange someone put the link in the um in the chat also, Ty Defoe has been putting up a bunch of folks' work. Yes, uh, Ty, and I'm gonna I'm gonna transfer those to the uh, YouTube as well. Dope. Yeah. Um, also, shout out to Ty and all of their amazing work. Yes, shout out to Ty. <laughs> inspiration. <laughs> Speaking um, of inspiration. Yes. Um, and then I will lift up um, my good friend Jesus Ivaez, um, and their work. Um, they do a bunch of solo projects um, specifically about around them and their, um, uh, gosh, their queer identity, their trans identity, their growing up um, as an un undocumented person um, in El Paso, Texas and Juarez and all that. Um, so yes, Jesus is a very dear friend, but also an amazing and inspirational person for me. Awesome. Um, and then let's see another good question. Oh, this one um, I found an interesting question is, can you tell us about any theater institution or company that has supported you well or spaces where you have felt safe or represented? Um, I can definitely give a shout out to MCC Theater as far as um, uh, their work is supporting me as a facilitator. Um, we have yet to get to work together um, where I get to audition for one of their shows, but um, um, and that's, and that's not, not shade or tea, unless it wants to be. Uh, but um, I think MCC Theater has done a really beautiful job of, um, uh, I mean, we've worked together now for quite a while and uh, they've done a really great job of supporting me as far as a facilitator. Um, and so I can definitely speak to that experience that I've had there has been really positive. Um, I, 
am also shocked to say, like a lot of them have been experiences that I've had as facilitator, as a facilitator. So um, I'm not like quite sure about, you know, how much I can advocate as far as artistic work. Um, but um, I, I'm amazed that I can say this, but on LCT also, the Lincoln Center Theater, like treated me very well. Um, and so I think that uh, that is another space that I, I mean, I have to honor as far as like, they really showed up, they paid me what I was worth and they didn't ask me to do more than what it was than what I had promised and what I had agreed to in my contract. So um, I have to, I have to uplift that as well. Um, also, uh, Long Wharf Theater, I just was um, hired as an independent consultant for their production of I Am My Own Wife. And I have to also give them their props uh, that they, and I have to especially give props to um, Hope Chavez who works there. Um, who I think it was probably, who I have a feeling is probably a lot of the, a lot of the effort behind that, who's the artistic producer there. Um, but I showed up there to do sort of cultural competency work and had very little work to do, honestly. And that was a, that was a great pleasure to have. So I, I definitely want to shout out those three, those three spaces. Um, once again, I am one person and I have, you know, pretty privilege, um, my own, you know, uh, proximity to whiteness and many other things that, you know, able-bodied, all kinds of things that make me, um, that make my own experience my own experience. And so I would never want my narrative to be used to um, uh, negate uh, anyone else's experience who has had a different experience with any of these institutions. Um, but I, I personally have been treated um, like a professional at the, in these spaces and treated like my, um, treated as I am, I am, as I am worth being treated at, in those spaces. Thank you. Okay, so here's what I wanna say. Um, I would be remiss if I did not uh, point out and uplift uh, how important accessibility is to me in theater. And, you know, like, I don't mean that necessarily from like a black or trans perspective, but really thinking about like disability um, and its intersections with theater and like how best to like serve community, you know, that means artists and people coming. Um, and so I will say in my world premiere, you know, like I have a lot of, <laughs> if there's one thing I get bossy about, it is about like you, but you are going to put a note on, you know, like an accessibility note, like, but we are gonna include these things because you're not gonna have me looking crazy out here in these streets, um, you know, not letting my people know if they can get into the theater or not. And I will say that I worked with New York Theater Workshop and Parody Productions on what is possibly the longest accessibility note I've ever seen in my whole life. But um, they were really open to, I mean, I did let them know from jump and continuing that they could expect for me to add on, you know. Um, so things such as like, how wide are these chairs? I need you to measure them. Like, you know, like, do you have chairs with arms and without arms? Can we make a note of that? I need you to count every step. I, can people use these bathrooms over here when they pick up their ticket? Like, black people don't like waiting out in the cold. So can they be inside? Because like, you know, like all those sort of things, um, they were open to and, and responded and so I also urge everybody else to just make those needs known, right? Like put it out there because I think that artists are really driving that movement, you know, by stating them as needs. Um, Thank okay. you for sharing that. Um, Dylan, did you, we don't have, I realize we don't have your donation link, I think, do we, is it in there? Uh, no, but that's fine. We can go to. Are you sure? Absolutely. Yeah. You, okay. You don't have because like, if you have one, let's let's pop it in there so we make oh, yeah, sure I'm plug good. in you. No, I would rather I'd rather uplift these other two badasses. So. Awesome. <laughs> um, do you want to close this out? I know that you had a something that I think you were thinking about leading us in. Yeah, totally. It's um just a a short um, breathing slash meditation exercise that I wanted to do just to kind of like. Um, close us out, um, bring us back to our present and, you know, be the woo-woo theater people that we're saying. And, and I say that in like a silliness, not like in, <laughs> in a derogatory way, whatever. <laughs> um, yeah. So if, um, 
everyone who is participating. Um, um, go ahead and like find your most comfortable position. If you are uh, seated, make sure you're, you're comfortable in that way. Um, if you need to lay down, lay down. If you're standing up, do whatever you need um, to um, make sure that you're, you're as grounded as possible. Um, all right, and so then I just invite you, if you feel comfortable, uh, close your eyes. Um, if not, you can keep a soft gaze. And then just take a big deep breath in, two, three, and out, two, three, and in, two, three, and out, two, three, one more. One, two, three, and out. Two, three. Now I want you to keep breathing deeply. Just listen to me as I talk. I want you to think about the sounds that you're hearing in the room. If it's your fan, maybe an AC unit, wind coming out through the window. Maybe it's some cars driving by. Ambulances happen, especially for those of us who live in cities. I hear birds twittering outside. And now let's come back to our breath. Focus on that. Breathing in and out and in and out. <sighs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Dylan. And I'd just like to thank um, all our panelists again uh, for just being wonderful, beautiful people. I'd like to thank my co-moderator, Marique, uh, for all that you do. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, uh, TGC for hosting this conference and for, uh, for all the shifting and reframing to focus on uh, the important issues and things of the day as they continue to shift um, and uh, thank you to all of you for being here, uh, all the attend attendees um, in the Zoom and on YouTube through HowlRound. Um, and there will be future uh, sessions coming up featuring more trans artists, um, Black trans artists. Uh, so, so keep on the lookout for that. Um, that, uh, that I won't be involved in, <laughs> um, for sure. Um, but I'm, I'm really happy to be uh, a part of this conversation. Uh, and, and thank you for, for, having, for having me here. Um, and and uh, it was wonderful to see all your faces. And um, I hope to see you again in the real world. Uh, hopefully, on, maybe on the streets, all right? And get out there and do do some action. I mean, you know, like protesting, not like to fight. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. Um, yeah. Thank you. And uh, we're gonna save. We'll save the chat, and uh, it is being recorded. So uh, all the all the resources with, that you should find on your own, but there will be the ones that we got today will be available uh, through the uh, TCG. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>